Hello, I'm Casey Aiken. This is 21 This Week. Coming up next, General Assembly considers more gun control laws, but are they constitutional? A woman's right to an abortion was enshrined in Maryland law in 1992, but after Dobbs' decision, does it need to be changed? In 2021, over 70% of all overdoses in Montgomery County were fentanyl related. What is the county doing to fix the problem? And tell me if you heard this joke before. Montgomery County Council pledges to cut red tape and become more business friendly. Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by former House of Delegate member, Marisa Morales, and president of the Federation of Republican Women, Lori Halverson. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. Welcome back. Maryland has some of the most stringent gun control laws in the country. It already requires a state permit to own a handgun. It requires firearm registration. It bans certain models of firearms like assault pistols and rifles. It is illegal to have a magazine with greater than 10 rounds. We have a red flag law and it requires background checks for private sales, not just from gun dealers. And yet, there are five additional gun control bills being debated by the General Assembly. Mara say, we'll go to you first. Do we need additional gun control laws? Absolutely, absolutely. And we see this as a bold move from obviously the majority here having you know the judicial proceedings chair as uh, the main sponsor for Senate Bill Number One. That is. You know, that is a, a um, an absolute priority for obviously for the majority there. We understand that Senator uh, Wildstriker's bill will now also prohibit the uh, the use or the carry or carrying any kind of firearm in someone's property without their consent, and then also uh, within a hundred yards of any public accommodations ranging from hotels to restaurants, etc. So I think that th- that is a uh, you know that is a sign that. the the General Assembly will be moving in that direction. And I think that that's something that we should be implementing in the state of Maryland, absolutely. Well, you know, speaking as an attorney, I I question, you know, the wisdom of some of of these laws as to whether or not they violate the Second Amendment of the Constitution in that it it allows individuals to to bear arms for for, for private protection. So how do we square that, Marisa? Absolutely. So the, the, the standard was actually the question in the Bruin case, and it's my understanding that the Fifth Circuit was looking into this. The, 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 the question there was whether the policy that's being reviewed, if that was applicable in the 18th century. Um, and so, you know, I think that if we were to bring that into the Fourth Circuit, um, I think that our, you know, that our, 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 our legislation would, there's very, there's very strong arguments that, that, you know, we're living in, in a different time. We're not in a, you know, militia era. We have, you know, you're walking into places where you have to figure out whether somebody, you know, because of a a bar situation, if they're carrying, it's just a different time. And I think that, you know, I think it's something that uh, we need to look at in terms of the times that we're living in. And if, and if our legislation matches with, you know, the actual practices of modern society. You know, uh, before I go to uh, Lori on this, I'll say, you know, I remember 10 years ago when we were discussing some of the gun control laws at that time. You know, the the greatest advocates who came up to me after the, the conversation were uh, crew members uh, uh, that were uh, on the, uh, the, the production crew who told me that they privately own guns because they're afraid for their, their, their own protection because of the rough neighborhoods they live in. So I'm not sure that, you know, the, the legislature is taking this all into account. And Lori, I know you testified uh, before the General Assembly on this issue, but I will point out that California has even more strict gun control laws than Maryland, and yet it saw four mass shootings in the month of January. So do gun control laws really do anything? Do we need additional gun laws? No, uh, not this not this type of gun law like that's that's in Senate Bill One, especially because Senate Bill One is an attempt to just take whatever the Supreme Court decided and just crunch it up and <laughs> throw it away um, because the Supreme Court ruled that a person with a concealed carry weapon um, does not 
uh, does no longer need, he no longer needs a proper cause to, to go outside of the home, that you could actually protect yourself outside of the home. Yet this law or this bill that they're trying to pass says you can't go within a hundred feet of a public um, governmental building or a private building if you don't have consent. You, but there are so many private buildings that are businesses. And so basically you can't go anywhere. Uh, and and there I when I was testifying, I was talking to a lot of gun owners um, uh, and learned a lot. Um, they were complaining that they can't even you know, go to um, uh, stop at a restaurant after they go hunting because they will have the gun still in their truck. And then, and, and that is a violation of this law and they could go to jail for up to a year for with a misdemeanor. That is just not, um, it's it, this, this law, if it passed, will protect um, criminals more than it protects citizens. I mean, people, I mean, this law is aimed at the people who um, are, are law-abiding citizens. Um, and if you look at, um, at 2010, for example, in the Discovery Building, there was a man named James Lee who was holding people hostage. And he had a backpack with um, bombs and a gun. And if it wasn't for an off-duty police officer, um, who knows what would have happened because he saved all the people inside um, working with the police uh, who were on duty trying to solve the problem. And guess what? He was told, that, that man was told uh, years ago by the judge to never go within 500 feet of the discovery building and did did that stop him no so, so yeah, Laura, this is not Laura, I, gotta, I want to i want to give mara say the last word here because you know obviously this is you know a subject that that many people feel threatened them both on pro and cons so Mar mara say you have the last 30 seconds absolutely i would just say that the legislation and all of them that, that prohibit the use they make an exception for military or law enforcement or anybody that needs to carry or uh, carry as part of their scope of, of their employment. So that would cover off-duty officers as well. And I think- yeah, But it doesn't know, cover the, you know, the guy the guy at 7-Eleven who, is, who uh, has somebody come in at three o'clock in the morning, you know, and wants to rob the place. I mean, that, you know, that's not part of their job is to have, have a gun for private protection, but they still may need one. So how do and you balance I, that? And and so and so that that is a philosophical that's that's a philosophical issue where you and I disagree. So okay. I don't think I don't think that individuals that don't have the proper training that don't understand uh, what they're getting them, themselves into um, should have uh, have and it's really about the access to guns. And we've seen that since the Supreme Court ruling that in the state of Maryland there has been a surge in uh, people asking for these permits from 16,000 to 80,000. Sure. So well, and they have proper training. Uh, those people have, have plenty of training. Right, we got it. We got to cut it off. I, I, I disagree. Right, we got to, we got to end it here because we've got two very, you know, two very important topics to also talk about. One dealing with the uh, General Assembly, and that is last June, the Supreme Court of the United States in a 6-3 decision called Jobs versus da Jackson overturned an earlier court decision which was famously known as you know Roe v Wade we all know what 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 occurred it in 1973 which legalized abortion in the United States now and according to Dobbs you know Dobbs overturned Roe and returned the matter of the decision of whether abortion should be legal or not back to the respective states to decide now here in Maryland you know voters it was a constitutional referendum in 1992 approved an amendment to the Maryland Constitution legalizing abortion up to the point of viability. Now, they did not define viability at the time, but they there have been interpretations that it goes to about 24 weeks. So Mara say the House of Delegates is seeking to enshrine a woman's right to choose in the Maryland Constitution. Well, we already have that. So what are they trying to do here? This is creating an absolute floor where basically the state uh, through, you know, would be prohibited from restricting to act like and having access and having access. So anywhere, you know, the fiscally speaking, the state obviously through its budget, um, you know, and appropriations, we can enshrine a right all day long. But if you are you know, taking away funding from Planned Parenthood or any kind of Title IX funding, then you are essentially saying, yes, the right is out there, but if you're not covered, then you're SOL. So that is this new legislation. What it would do is creates a, a floor, uh, making sure that not only you have the right to uh, an abortion, but you also have access to an abortion. Well, it, it seems to me it's doing much more than that. It seems to me that it's opening the door for late-term abortions, which uh, is, is contrary 
to the, the constitutional amendment that was found in, that was approved in 1992. Why, why do we want to go beyond the standards that we already have? You still want me to, to address that? Anything, yeah, sure. anything that precludes a decision from a, from a, from a, uh, made by a woman um, is, not, is not the place for the government. So I would absolutely be in favor um, and in support it, supportive of uh, uh, Speaker Jones' uh, new legislation. Okay, so Lori, I'll you know I'll just you know I don't need to rephrase the question. I mean, we we have the we have the constitutional right in, in, to an abortion in based on the 1992 referendum. Right. Why do we need to make changes? We don't. Um, they're really trying to cement um, everything, but also add more. It's not just about the woman's right to choose. Um, the the language is very vague. And it, it, it has wording that say included, uh, including but lot not limited to, which um, makes you wonder what else does this, could this possibly mean? Um, for example, it might mean that a man would have no voice at all if, uh, if he's the father, um, that he would have no voice at all. It also could mean that um, when you look at a prior bill last year, it included um, wording about um, perinatal, which could mean 28 days after birth, which could mean that um, for failure to act, which which definitely, which means, you know, you could just leave a baby um, out uh, with, without feeding the baby for 28 days and the mother would not be uh, at fault. And um, that was a bill that was out there last year that didn't make it through, but that might be encompassing in this, this language here that they're trying to pass. Um, so, uh, I, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't, it's not necessary to do this. There's, we have the strongest, one of the strongest um, uh, laws uh, on abortion in the United States. Uh, you know, and we're we're actually becoming a magnet for all the other states to come here for abortions. So, um, you know, do you want to be more of a magnet? Um, maybe so. Maybe that maybe that's what I, I, I just want to make make it make it understood. You know, for the viewers, that the Dobbs decision did not ban abortions in Maryland. We, no, our, correct. Our, our state constitution still provides for that. That's right. Yes. Right. And so, and, and by enshrining and, and furthering, um, educating the public and, and saying that the state cannot uh, restrict access. So that's what the, that's what this is about. And then just going off of, um, you know, being able to provide the services of, of abortion. Um, yes, the legislature, the legislature has also increased the, the types of providers that can also perform these they abortions. Did that last so, year. Well, and does it mean that you can have an abortion all the way up to the birth? Um, you know, it, it doesn't say now, is it about viability at, at like 22 weeks or whatever, or is it now going past that? Um, so I have a lot of questions about this and don't think that uh, I think we need to go further intent. with our current I think laws. that's the clear intent is, yeah. to, is to go beyond the viability standard that, that already exists. Anyway, right. I want to thank you both for uh, weighing in on that subject. When we come, when we come back from this short break, how is the drug crisis hurting America's youngest people? And what in Montgomery County are we doing about it to address it? Stay tuned. And welcome back. In 2021, over 70% of all overdoses in Montgomery County were fentanyl related. And since then, the problem has only seemed greater. In late December of 22, Montgomery County Public uh, School Systems Medical Officer released an urgent message to the MCPS community about the dangers of fentanyl because the problem was so, becoming so pervasive in the school system. This January, county officials hosted a workshop on the use of the over, overdose drug Narcan, and it was uh, you know, attended you know, overwhelmingly by the public. But what else are we doing? Lori, other than hosting awareness workshops and articles in the media, what else can the county do? Well, I feel like they're on the tail end of what the problem really is. And if you look at the increases of fentanyl um, overdoses, they went straight up on a chart when uh, Biden became president. When they were, when um, Trump was president, it was, you know, more, it was still going up, um, but not near as high as it was going up. Is um, that because of drug availability? I mean, yes, and I believe that that those open borders, um, and that's not the, all the the only way that fentanyl is coming through, but a lot of fentanyl is coming through the borders, 
and um, and Trump did an excellent job of of working to shut that down. And um, and now and you know when we're just saying yeah just keep the borders open well, we need to be welcoming to well, all. People. What can we do about it? What can we do about it locally? Here. I'm sorry. What? What can we do about it locally? I mean, we we have a local problem. We need to come out publicly and support. Um, uh, no longer support open borders, support ways to control the border. I think when, when that happens, you know, we also need to work on our families and, and helping our families to um, to talk to their children, help help children, because, you know, mental health is a huge problem right now, with especially with young women. So we need to work on um, things to help, help children ment with mental illness issues. Um, so there's a lot of things we can do <laughs> besides, you know, Narcan is, is definitely something you have to do right now. I can understand why they're doing that, but um, but there's a lot of other things that need to be when done. You say Narcan is you mean the the wide distribution of Narcan? Yeah, well, the schools now have access to that, which I think you know that's saving children right now. But it's too bad it's come to this. I mean, years ago, I remember putting in a, a warning about it on my Facebook page because I saw it coming years ago, um, but people were ignoring it. Oh, back I want then. I want to go to Marseille on this. Marseille, <clears throat> you know, we we've talked about you know, the, the sources of this this drug epidemic. We saw this week, Maryland Attorney General Anthony Brown announced indictments against six individuals for drug uh, trafficking. And the, the headline on the Baltimore Sun was, you know, warning, officials warning that Mexican cartels are here. So how do we combat the drug problem? Is there, is there a role for law enforcement as well as just overall awareness of the problem. Absolutely. I mean, anything that has to do with prevention and access, law enforcement has always had a role. Um, but when it comes to fentanyl and the opioid epidemic, um, you know, we really have to look at our big pharma and our pharmaceutical um, loopholes. Um, and not only that, but I think that the, the discussion was about, you know, locally, what what are our, our what's our county doing, et cetera. Um, I think I think it would be ill-advised to make this again an anti-immigrant situation. If there are drug cartels, if there are uh, organized crime, that's an issue that can come from from anywhere, even within um, allies within the country. That has nothing to do with the borders. Um, you know, the drugs aren't coming through the borders. We know that people are coming here to ask for help for, for asylum issues. So I think you know making this an anti-immigrant and a xenophobic. Um, you know, argument is against everything that I believe in. I would say <laughs> this is a pharmaceutical issue, big pharma issue. Um, and I think that the more uh, educated the public becomes along the access to it, um, how kids are getting are getting access to Z uh, Xanax, Adderall, Percocet, Oxycodone that uh, families and, and adults are having within their, you know, just within their, their households. And then um, predators you know, uh, bec uh, coming after children that have access to, to these and then putting fentanyl, et cetera, and combining, that's a whole issue that we understand is happening here in the DC area. And I think, and I, I absolutely agree. I think it's, 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 it's really alarming seeing these 120% increase in deadly uh, youth overdoses in the county. I think we need to address this head on. Um, and we understand that the, the, the MCPS along with DHHS uh, are working on prevention harm reduction and, and treatment. And I hope that we can uh, see more. I, I don't view closing the border as, as anti-immigrant. I, immigrant. I view it as pro-immigrant. We need to protect everyone who's in, in within the walls of our United States right now. It's a war against our children. We need to, we need to fight back. And the only way to do it is to stop drugs from coming in uh, illegally. So that's yeah. the issue. You know, I, I will point out, you know, that not only, um, is the, are the drugs being manufactured overseas? They're being ma manufactured in the United States. I think that was part of the warning that um, Anthony Brown was making was delivering. There was a major drug bust in, in Texas of a manufacturing facility where the, they were manufacturing fentanyl uh, pills and other pills associated therewith. Uh, so it's not just um, you know an importation issue. It's it's an issue that's that we're around. But it's a scary deal. I mean, when you hear stories of young people who thought they were taking Adderall to help them study, and they end up taking a drug that's infected with fentanyl, and they die, that's a parent's worst worst. It is, nightmare. yeah. It's a terrible situation, and I think we can be agreed that this is something we all have to work on. I'm sorry, we have to run to our, our final topic, because I want to <laughs> talk about our county. And, you know, our county 
you know, deservedly or not, gets a, you know, gets a, gets a, has a reputation for not being very business friendly. And, you know, I know, you know, we've had Mike Knapp on, Mike Knapp and Nancy Florine, both past council members, they know that, that we need to have businesses here in order to support ourselves. So, but this week, once again, we have the county council president, Evan Glass, announcing that he has a roadmap to develop Montgomery County's economic development. And when I hear this, it just, you know, I'm thinking, I've heard this all before. It's like, it's like a bad comedy routine that, that just doesn't work. So, Lori, what's the answer? I mean, is it just <laughs> streamlining the permit process or is there something else we can do? It reminds me was when I was on the State Board of Education and they were tackling Baltimore City and I'd see them meeting in the walls of the State Board building and they're not going to accomplish that much if they're just meeting inside the building all the time. And I think if when you're forming a new economic development committee, um, that that can maybe help, but you really need to get out there. Um, Evan Glass um, recently went to a brewery and um, talked to talk to a business owner and learned something. Oh my gosh. So maybe what if they actually went out and purposely talked to businesses all around the county and got feedback from them, actually listened to them and got their information and then tried to make action from it, not just talk about it and here's what we're going to do and here's our plan. I mean, they really needed to um, do something and show the show the business owners what they that they really listen to them <laughs> well Mar i got to go to marissa marissa uh, you know is, is it just a matter of cutting red tape or is there something else that we can do well definitely that's that's a good you know step in the right direction i'm, I'm a business owner and i would say um you know i think evan glass is making an, an earnest you know effort i mean i think you know in in addition to obviously uh streamlining the permit process just looking at how, how to modernize it i mean i i I go to a hair salon um, in in Wheaton, who you know an, an owner. She was basically she had her her space rented out for like ninety days without her permit, you know, being processed. Uh, uh, you know, something that she could actually a, a building that she could actually go in physically, but was not able to to go in uh, because of closures and and people not being you know not working from not working in the office. There are major setbacks for for business owners and people that are investing and taking risks. And I think we should be doing more. Um, if I'm quite honest, to incentivize, you know, risk takers and people that are investing their money. I mean, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a product of business owners. My, my, my father had a, uh, had a small computer repair shop growing up. That's how we fed ourselves. I'm a small business owner. So I think the county does need to do a little bit more. Well, at least we found one, <laughs> one topic we have agreement on. So stay tuned for parting shots. Now with parting shots, I've forgotten who's up first. Lori Halverson, I'll just do, do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, just want to shout out to all the people that um, are paying attention to what's going on in Annapolis. Uh, if you are a Republican, um, now's the time to really pay attention because there's a lot of, of really radical bills coming through. And 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 if you want to live here in, in peace, and feel, I mean, I just feel like you've got to get involved. If, if you don't get involved, and then, it, you know, who's at fault for, for all these things that are happening right now? So um, please get out there, get an uh, my MGA account and sign up to testify. When you testify, it becomes public record and um, they can't ignore you. Um, they have to listen to what you're saying. So anyway, that's what I want to say. Thank you, Lori. Marissa Morales, your parting <laughs> shot. Lori actually took took my my PSA. Oh, okay. <laughs> but but just along those lines, you have you have until um, about the second week of, of March before crossover. That means that the House bills will go over to the Senate and vice versa. So you definitely want to get you know that first bite at the apple. Um, get your words in if there are rallies, etc. This is you know we're looking at reproductive rights, gun control. So there are definitely really hot button issues, and you know and it's. You know, your tax your taxes that pay for for for, for this legislation and for the policy so you might as well be a participant of it <laughs> thanks Morris. i'm sorry we you know we, we had a nice conversation we ran out of time for party shots almost uh, i want to thank you both for for appearing you know these are not easy topics and i know that uh, but they're important topics for our community so i want to thank you for participating today i want to thank the audience for tuning in each and every week to montgomery county's hardest hitting political talk show for 21 this week, I'm Casey Aiken.